Today, we are reporting from the 2020 ASCO Virtual Scientific Program. We are recapping some of the top news that have been presented during the conference, and soon we'll speak with Drs. Brian Reaney and Christopher Sweeney on some significant data being presented in genitourinary cancers, as well as Dr. Roy Herbst on some practice-changing lung cancer studies. Welcome to Enclave News Network, I'm Gina Columbus. Findings from the phase three Keno 204 trial show that treatment with pembrolizumab induced a 4.9 month progression-free survival benefit over brintuximab vidotin in patients with relapse refractory classical Hodgkin lymphoma. In Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia, results of the phase three Aspen trial show that xanobrutinib was associated with a higher complete response or very good partial response rate as well as clinically meaningful advantages in safety and tolerability compared with ibrutinib in this patient population. Over half of patients with PIK3CA positive, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative advanced breast cancer who had prior treatment with a CDK4-6 inhibitor plus an aromatase inhibitor were alive without disease progression six months after starting treatment with alpalisib plus fulvestrin, as seen in findings from the phase two by leave trial. An updated findings from part one of the phase three Checkmate 227 trial, patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer and tumor PDL1 expression of 1% or greater or less than 1% experienced durable and long-term efficacy benefits from frontline treatment with nivolumab and ipilimumab compared with chemotherapy. Additionally, results from the Checkmate 9LA trial suggested that frontline treatment with nivolumab plus ipilimumab combined with two cycles of platinum doublet chemotherapy in patients with metastatic or recurrent non-small cell lung cancer should be considered a new option for this population, as the trial showed a superiority in overall survival with the immunotherapy combination versus chemotherapy alone. In triple negative breast cancer, pembrolizumab in combination with several chemotherapy partners led to a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in, in progression-free survival compared with chemotherapy alone as a first-line treatment for patients with locally recurrent, inoperable, or metastatic disease with tumors that express PD-L1 with a combined positive score of 10 or higher, according to results of the Phase 3 Keynote 355 trial. The DREAM clinical trial program continues to highlight the antibody drug conjugate belantamab mafodotin in multiple myeloma. In DREAM2, single agent belantamab mafodotin sustained clinically meaningful deep responses and was well tolerated in patients with heavily pretreated relapse refractory multiple myeloma. In the DREAM6 study, belantamab mafodotin in combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone demonstrated a high rate of clinical benefit and an acceptable safety profile in patients with relapse refractory disease. Also in multiple myeloma, the BCMA targeting CAR T-cell therapy edacaptogene viclusol induced a response in nearly three-fourths of patients with heavily pretreated relapse refractory multiple myeloma in data from the pivotal phase two KARMA trial. The overall response rate with AD cell was 73%, including a complete response rate of 33%. The median duration of response was 10.7 months, and the median progression-free survival was 8.8 .8 months. First in human findings from the phase one alpha study demonstrated that the allogeneic chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy, ALO501, when paired with the monoclonal antibody, ALO647, has clinical activity and a manageable safety profile in patients with relapse refractory, large B-cell, or follicular lymphoma. Updated results exploring the novel KRAS G12C inhibitor, AMG510, demonstrated early evidence of a consistent safety profile and anti-cancer activity across a range of advanced KRAS G12C mutant solid tumors, other than non-small cell lung cancer and colorectal cancer. In prostate cancer, results of the phase three HERO trial, Relogalix, demonstrated superiority over luperolide acetate and sustained testosterone suppression through 48 weeks in patients with advanced prostate cancer. Also in cohort findings of an interim analysis of the DESTINY Lung 01 trial, Famtrastuzumab durex TKEN NXKI demonstrated favorable clinical activity with a high objective response rate and durable responses in patients with HER2 mutant non-small cell lung cancer. 
In ovarian cancer, mervituximab, sorovtanzine, in combination with bevacizumab, demonstrated encouraging overall response rates in patients with platinum agnostic ovarian cancer, regardless of platinum status, with a favorable tolerability profile. Updated survival data of the phase two portion of the AVANOVA trial show that clinical outcomes in patients with recurrent ovarian cancer who were treated with neuroparib plus bevacizumab were significantly improved when compared with neuroparib alone. For more 2020 ASCO Virtual Scientific Program findings, please visit www.onclive.com. Well, good morning. It is day two of the 2020 ASCO Virtual Scientific Program. We have two guests on with us today. We're first here with Dr. Brian Reaney, who's the inaugural chief of clinical trials at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. And we are also here with Dr. Christopher Sweeney, who's a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Hello to both of you this morning, and thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? We're good. Well, thanks, thanks, Tina. Good. Good. Thank you so much. I'm so, I'm so excited to have you both on. There is so much genitourinary cancer research that's being presented at this year's meeting, of course. Uh, first, I'd like to really take a look at some of the pivotal renal cell carcinoma studies that are being presented. Maybe we kick it off with the TiVo3 trial, which is comparing tivozinib to serafinib in patients with metastatic disease. What are your thoughts on these data? Yeah, so TiVo3, as you said, was tivozinib, which is a small molecule by Jeff receptor inhibitor, set of sort of a long and storied history in kidney cancer. This was done in a third and fourth line setting, and the data was, has been presented and published. This is an update. So it showed a progression-free survival advantage for tivozinib in that setting. And I think there's two things that are important about these data. One is that it's probably the best tolerated TKI. So, um, you know, there's a lot of TKIs approved in kidney cancer. This is in the refractory setting. So from a clinical standpoint, it's not a game changer. But for me, when I'm turning from immune therapy, which can be curative to TKI therapy, it's about disease control and, and therefore tolerability takes on greater importance. <clears throat> and so I think that's the advantage to this particular compound. And I think that's what these data show. And then the other important thing, um, TIBO-1, which was a frontline study that had a similar design had a, had a one-way crossover and one of the worst sort of blunders of trial design in history. And so the, it looked like the patients initially randomized to serafinib lived longer. And that's why it wasn't approved years ago. Um, this has a hazard ratio of basically one, just below one. So it's sort of reassurance that there's no survival detriment, which wouldn't have made sense. But that was sort of a lingering question out there. Absolutely. And now we're also seeing some longer follow-up from the Keno 426 trial. That's obviously first-line pembrolizumab and exitinib in advanced renal cell carcinoma. So what do you think that these updated findings tell us about the combination? I mean, these so the initial presentation and publication, uh, which is around ASCO-GU last year, um, had a median follow-up of about 12 months. Um, and this is, I think, about 27 months. So it's, it's much more mature data. It's in line with the uh, uh, follow-up from Checkmate 214 when it was reported first reported. Um, so there's not surprisingly still a, a survival benefit that's continued, similar PFS benefit, median of about 15 months. Um, the complete response rate has sort of matured over time to about 9%, um, again, just with longer follow-up. So I think it's really just a, a better reflection of the, the quality of the data and the, the um, benefit of the regimen. Um, that first look um, was meant to just be a PFS look turned into a look into OS because it was so strikingly positive but had some limitations in terms of limited follow-up. So I think it's just a more robust data set, but really similar story. Absolutely, thank you so much. Now, sabalitinib uh, was another agent that was found to show some encouraging efficacy, this time in papillary renal cell carcinoma. So could you speak to this agent and how it could potentially impact treatment for patients? Yeah, so sabalitinib, so you know, over the last many years, we, um, the kidney cancer field has been looking at the role of MET in papillary kidney cancer. So our hereditary version of papillary kidney cancer is characterized by MET gene alterations. And so in sporadic papillary kidney cancer, um, I think about 30 or 50 percent have some form of MET alteration, um, whether it's genetic alteration or at the protein level, et cetera, some form of MET uh, overexpression or activation. And there have been single arm studies that have shown some activity, but it was never quite clear whether that was from MET or from the VEGF inhibiting part of those drugs that were used. So this was a randomized trial that looked at sabalitinib, a MET inhibitor versus sunitinib, a VEGF receptor inhibitor, which is a standard of care in, in that particular subset. 
And so it was sort of good news and bad news. The good news was there looked like there was, you know, a higher response rate with the sabalitinib, um, uh, some advantage in progression-free and even overall survival, but the study was ended early. Um, it's still not exactly clear why to me. I think as the sunitinib data came out, that arm was performing better than expected. And so I think the, the company sponsor realized that in order to show a difference, they would have had to keep the trial going for many more years and many more hundreds of patients. And this is a biomarker subset of a rare subset of kidney cancer. So a very difficult trial to do. So again, some signals of activity, but it's not clear to me where that drug's gonna go because these data aren't enough in itself to register the drug. And unfortunately, this trial showed us that although it's a great design, it was very hard to execute. So it's, it's a bit of a disappointment for the field because this is exactly the trial that we should be doing, right? Biomarker selected trials, et cetera. Um, and it was somewhat successful, but, but ultimately not. So um, sort of good and bad news from that trial. Those are some really great points. Thank you. Now let's move on to some pivotal prostate cancer data. The Condor trial, for example, is looking at the PSMA targeting imaging agent 18F DCFPYL PET CT in biochemically recurrent prostate cancer. Could you shed some light on these data? For sure. So I think there's lots of numbers that were presented in both the presentation by Mike Morris in this uh, Condor, the rising PSA setting, as well as in the presentation of uh, localized disease by Thomas Hope. I just want to just really get above the noise of all the numbers and try and make sense of it. It is very clear that technology is much more able to identify cancer when it's present um, than conventional imaging. Then that's reported as the positive predictive value or the, um, uh, the truth as they were calling it. The bottom line is, let's just get to the, to the chase. This imaging agent, PSMA PET, be it with the gallium approach, be it with the PL, PYL approach, identifies cancer better than a CAT scan or a bone scan, be it lymph node enlargement on a CAT scan, be it abnormalities on a bone scan or a CAT scan, evidence of metastatic disease. However, what it does do is actually it identifies really a new state of disease of PSMA PET positive, conventional scan negative. And in the Condor study, it is the PSMA PET positive in the uh, rising PSA, but we do not see anything on a CAT scan. So it does a better job of that. The question is how do we implement that new knowledge into how to, to treat patients better? So what I would like to do is pivot if you would, to how do we think about this in the management of patients? So I think it is very helpful in terms of where we use radiation and hormonal therapy in the salvage setting for a patient with a rising PSA post prostatectomy. What it can do is help identify where to radiate with a little bit more accuracy with the hope that we can actually cure patients. So this is the patient who had a prostatectomy, their PSA has risen after the prostatectomy, we would normally just radiate the prostate bed and give a course of hormonal therapy. But here, if you see disease in the um, associated draining lymph nodes, you may want to escalate the radiation to those lymph nodes. And it is possible that we may increase the number of patients who are cured with this salvage therapy. Where it gets a little bit more complicated is the patient who has an isolated uh, area of disease in their bone uh, or in their retropedal lymph nodes, it, which may or may not be cancer. It's not 100% into uh, identifying if cancer is present. There is a false negative and a false positive rate. So what I am concerned about is the following, people de-escalating therapy. So I would be cautious of not abandoning what potentially can cure a patient by doing radiation and hormonal therapy to the prostate bed and possibly the nodes with a course of hormones in the patient with a low positive PSA and hoping the systemic therapy can deal with the micrometastatic disease that is not seen on the conventional scans and may be present, may be present as evidenced by the PSMA PET. It's not perfect. The other scenario that I'm very cautious and I have seen happen and been at many tumor boards around the world where a patient comes in, they have a PSA of 0.2, they get sent to a, for a PSMA PET, they come back to the treating physician and they see nothing on the scan. And then they say, oh, good news, we don't see anything of scan, we can wait. 
and then they wait till they see something on a PSMA pet. The PSA is now 1.0, and we know the ability to cure those patients with a higher PSA, PSMA, high PSA, and possibly PSMA pet positive now, the chance of curing them is less. So do not de-escalate, do not delay the potentially curative salvage therapy in that setting is my main message slash warning. And I'm going to be harping on about that in many venues because I've seen it. And I've seen it in That's some great insight, Dr. Sweeney. Thank you so much. Now, uh, some overall survival updates are also being presented from the Spartan trial and the Aramis trial with abalutamide and darolutamide respectively. So what is now known with the longer follow-up that's being presented this year? So we'll just go back and just reiterate that these studies were all three studies, Aramis, Prosper, Spartan, all using an antigen receptor antagonist more potent than the big lutamides and the lutamides added on to patients who have conventional scan negative, possibly PSMA PET positive at the time of a rising PSA when they have a castrate level testosterone, also known as M0 CRPC, M0 to conventional scans. All of them have the, pretty much the same design. All of them have a major improvement in time to radiographic progression free survival, which was the primary endpoint and was very positive very early, showing that adding potent AR inhibition delays the time to progression. All of those studies were approved based on the secondary endpoints. And the first endpoint really that supported the asymptomatic improvement in the scan was clinical benefit, quality of life not going down, adverse event profile looking good, and possibly improvements in quality of life over time and delaying progression both RPFS1 and RPFS2. Great news. What is even what I gave all of that data a B based on that input for clinical benefit. What we do now see is that all three studies have the same degree of a survival benefit in the long run. The Aramis study has the least mature data and it speaks to the, it has a hazard ratio of about 0 0.69, 0 0.7 that it reports, whereas the more mature data sets have a hazard ratio of about 0 0.75, 0 0.8. All of them are tracking for a median survival, Aramis isn't quite there, of about six years on the placebo, adding on salvage therapy at progression, and about seven and a half years, so about maybe about an 18 month, 15 month improvement in median survival, just using that landmark that we're so confident and so reproducing. So all of the studies are saying the same thing. All of them have a good safety profile, and they're, I, think, I say the data's gone from a B to an A in terms of clinical benefit, by using these AR inhibitors, potent AR inhibitors earlier. That's great, thank you. Now I'd really also love to pick your brain about the HERO trial, which is comparing uh, relugalix with repairalide acetate for advanced prostate cancer. What do you think about these data? And by the HERO trial, you're not present, referring to one that Brian really presented or anything like that. We're talking about <laughs> antigen receptor inhibition. So let's go back and just really look at this. I don't know if anyone else looks at the name Religolix or how you pronounce it and just harkens back to Asterix and Obelix books that may speak to people from Europe and Australia. It was cartoon books. But this is an oral LHRH antagonist. So it's an oral preparation and it um, is an antagonist opposed to Luprolide and Gozerolin, which are agonists, whereas Degorelex is an antagonist and all the other ones I just mentioned. Uh, um, IM or subcutaneous preparations. So this is oral and an antagonist. That's how it differs. What it does do is it actually gets castrate levels of testosterone much more rapid than luprolide. Good news. So it can actually replace degoralix as an antagonist in that setting and probably a lot better tolerated in terms of less need for two big injections in the stomach, which not infrequently have um, some skin reactions. So that's problematic for degoralix. So there's an advantage there. The other advantage that we saw with the 48 week of dosing that uh, Neil Shaw presented as a presentation, but also as a New England Journal publication yesterday, is that there's a much more rapid recovery of testosterone, good news, once the therapy stops. Whereas the depot preparations, it takes a while for the testicles to wake up after having been suppressed for such a long time. So there's more rapid recovery, good news. The other aspect is this notion that there's this specter about these LHRH agonists causing some degree of um, cardiovascular disease. And that plays out here 
And there's a lot of speculation as to why and how, but there is some data, and I'm going to speculation land, that the LHRH agonist with the FSH, LH surge and the like, um, makes unstable plaques in patients who have unstable cardiovascular so plaques are more stable and they're more likely to have cardiac events. There's biology around that, um, which people would have to dig into, but there is some potential biology why an antagonist, antagonist would work better. They ended up seeing uh, less MACE, major um, cardiovascular events is the term they use, MACE, from 2.9 to 6, uh, with the antagonist versus 6.2%. So that's encouraging. Dealing, delving into the data a little bit more was really interesting to see that the MACE events separated early, so presumably when these unstable plaques are most relevant in the first six months from what I can see. The curves separate early and stay separated, but don't increase after six months. I've got to look at that a bit more carefully, but it looks like the cardiovascular benefits are in the first six months of therapy. It's also most prominent in those who have active cardiovascular effects. So my early thinking about where I would use this would be in patients where I would be looking to use a short course of testosterone suppression namely with intermediate risk rate uh, therapy, localized disease, where you're giving radiation for six months and uh, so the castration for six months with the radiation. So that's good news for rapid recovery. That's hoping that the extra three months of recovery doesn't increase the, the benefits, the efficacy of the uh, uh, parental present uh, preparations, but good news for patients, their testosterone recovers and they get over the treatment burden earlier. The other benefit is in patients where you are worried about these agents because of cardiovascular risk factors. Having said that, do not forget about getting to the cardiologist. If a patient has some angina, has some congestive heart failure, before you start any of this therapy, get them with and partner with a cardiologist. If they've got an unstable plaque and they are a candidates for a, a stent, get the stent before you put them on these therapies. But it's an advance, and there is definitely a place for the use of these antagonist oral agents for patient benefit. Cost, uh, the other issue is I'm not sure there's going to be a benefit for the patient who's on long-term uh, compliance when you're on these therapies for two, three, five, ten years, where the subcutaneous preparation may be easier and the castration resistance setting and co-pays with these oral agents is going to be a question. So I think there's going to be a niche, but I don't think it's going to completely replace the subcutaneous present uh, preparations, the parental preparations, I am subcutaneous. You made some really, really great points. Thank you so much. Okay, now I want to move so over into I <laughs> I want to move over into urethral cancer, where we're also seeing a lot of really pivotal data at this year's meeting. Uh, obviously, we have to cover the Javelin Bladder 100 study, which is looking at maintenance of Velumab after platinum-based first line chemotherapy in advanced bladder cancer. This was a late breaker abstract that did garner a lot of attention this year. Um, could you shed some light on that? Uh, yeah, I can talk about that. <clears throat> so as you mentioned, this is a late breaker. It was abstract number one from our friend and fellow your amigo, Tom Powell. So this was a, so PD-1 therapy or checkpoint therapy in terms of integration into bladder cancer has been sort of an evolving story. It hasn't been as sort of clean as other, other diseases like RCC. And so this is some of the first data, certainly the most strikingly positive data. And I think assuming approval or immediately changes practice. So as you mentioned, this was a trial in um, uh, advanced uh, urothelial cancer patients who got four to six cycles of a platinum-based chemotherapy and had stable disease or a response were then randomized to either get uh, a Velumab PD-L1 inhibitor, uh, maintenance of Velumab as it was called, or best supportive care. And really sort of striking results both in the overall uh, population and in the subset of PD-L1 positive patients, which I think was about 50% of patients. So the uh, overall survival hazard ratio was 0.69. Uh, and it was 0.56 in the PDL1 positive, so a, an enhanced benefit in that subset. And also um, progression free survival benefits as well with similar hazard ratios. And the, the drug was really well tolerated as usually single agent, you know, checkpoint inhibitor therapy is. So this, um, you know, it, it immediately sort of again changes practice. It's easy to implement. It's not necessarily surprising because patients with bladder cancer who respond obviously are more favorable than non-response, but once you lose that response, those patients are in trouble and they often don't make it in for other therapy or they're not able to get adequate therapy. So it's really, in essence, just moving up their second line checkpoint inhibiting therapy, which we know has advantages from 
other studies and there's many drugs approved in that setting. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, no, another very important study was the um, IMVIGOR 010 trial. That's looking at adjuvant and tezolizumab versus observation and high-risk muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma. So didn't have quite the same positive data, but it's still very important studying. Can you can explain a little bit about why that is? Yeah, so this was the large adjuvant atezo study. I think it's the first adjuvant study of checkpoint to read out in, in bladder cancer. Uh, and as you mentioned, it was um, patients with either primary bladder or upper tract included about, I think, five or seven percent of upper tract patients who had a resection. About half had gotten prior neoadjuvant therapy. I think about half were node positive, so it was a fairly high risk group uh, in terms of the, their risk of recurrence. Um, and they got a year of adjuvants, atezolizumab or observation. Um, and then disease free survival was the primary endpoint. And as you noted, there was no difference in either disease-free or overall survival, both hazard ratios were, well, one was 0.89 and 0.85. So trend in the right direction, but not significant in this very study. So disappointing what it means for, you know, other adjuvant immunotherapy-based trials, we'll see, um, you know, whether it's a drug effect or a whole class effect. So again, I think both of these studies show that, you know, the role of checkpoint inhibitors and exactly where to integrate them in bladder cancer hasn't been straightforward. Chemotherapy certainly still has a role in the frontline setting, um, as we've seen, you know, and the integration of these either very early or as maintenance or a second line therapy, I think is still evolving. Now, uh, in terms of targeted therapies in bladder cancer, infragratinib is also being evaluated in advanced and unresectable or metastatic urothelial carcinoma in the first line as well as the later line treatment settings. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the activity with this agent in this space? Yeah, so this is an FGF inhibitor, and over the last couple of years, these have sort of been, been developed in, in bladder cancer, one is approved. And uh, this particular agent, there's some data at ASCO that looked at it both, I think, in a first and later line setting, first and, and second or later line setting, um, again, in advanced urothelial cancer. And the response rate was about 25 or 30%, which is in line with what other FGF inhibitors uh, you know, have produced in this disease. So, and I'd say the same about this as I did about checkpoint inhibitors, and they're even earlier in development that I think figuring out where to integrate these, right now it's in a salvage setting, which makes a lot of sense for a subset of patients who have FGFR mutations. Um, but there are trials going on integrating them earlier into the course of bladder cancer, combining with immune therapy, et cetera. So I think this sort of adds to the, to the data of this class of agents in general. Absolutely, thank you so much. Now. Uh, we have to talk about your amigos, so uh, I'd love to have you both kind of discuss the latest with your group, some of the podcasts you've been producing, and how we've all been collaborating during ASCO and obviously through the whole COVID-19 pandemic, some of the efforts you've been doing. Sure, Chris, you want to start? Yeah, so I'm uh, probably the most lazy, least involved of the podcasts, but uh, always invited, happy to be invited and join in when I can. Brian and Tom have been doing a great job. And they meld a couple of things, um, just the human nature of looking at data and how to do, look at and analyze it and what are the high points, what are the low points, what are the actual nitty gritty issues, what are the uh, inside secrets behind the studies, if you would, the back, store, back, the, uh, back door conversations, the back room conversations, I should say. Um, and there's a bit of humor with it. The other thing is, it's a great opportunity, I think, for the investigators to speak with their peers in a very um, informal manner. So Brian and Tom have been doing a great job. Informal in as much as there is some opportunity for some lightheartedness, but also uh, to really delve into the details without um, much pressure really. So we welcome everyone to join um, for a lighthearted but good look at the data sets. Keep going. Yeah, that's yeah I mean, so we've done about I don't know, maybe 35 podcasts so far overall. We started uh, maybe four or six months ago. Uh, yeah, it was four months ago, initially some GU, then we delved into COVID. We did a lot of COVID related podcasts for obvious reasons and, and taking advantage of all our international members and the different, what was going on geographically that was very different you know, all over the world. And then for ASCO, I think we have eight or 10 podcasts of basically the major oral presentations at ASCO, many of which we've talked about today. Uh, and as Chris said, it's really, it's educational just to sit, you know, there's one thing about reading an abstract and seeing somebody present it. It's all, that's all very sort of stiff and formal. What's nice about podcasts, as Chris alludes to, is that it's informal, um, especially with Tom leading it. And you could just get a chance to really dig in, see what people really think, you know, think about it from a 
applicability standpoint, you know, kind of like, you know, you do during these interviews is what does it really mean? How does it affect patients? Like, how do we use the data in practice? Does this affect the patient I'm going to see on Monday, you know, or not? And so, and, and it's nice and it's, you know, sort of short format, it's digestible. It's meant to be about 20 minutes. We find people lose their attention span after that. Um, but it's, it's been successful. We've gotten a lot of good feedback. So again, there's a lot around ASCO, you know, that we've put out over, over the last day or so, I guess. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun. And would you mind just uh, sharing um, all the members that are part of your Amigos and for people that want to get more information on your podcast or um, find you on Twitter, uh, where can they locate you? So, the, so uh, Chris and I, Tom Powell's, Dave McDermott are the, the male 50% members. And then Silky Gillison, who's in Switzerland, prostate cancer expert. Kala Sridhar, who is bladder cancer expert at Princess Margaret in Toronto. Uh, Christina Rodriguez Suarez, who just had a baby, by the way, um, who is at Val de Bron in Spain. And Laurence Albiget, who is uh, at um, Gustave Rousy in France, who is uh, a kidney cancer expert. So a uh, fairly diverse group in terms of expertise. Um, finding us on Twitter, active on Twitter, probably as we should be. Uh, but we're at at your amigos. Each of us usually have individual accounts that we sort of tie in as well. And the podcasts, uh, we've tried to post on Twitter links, but they're on Apple and Spotify and sort of the major platforms. Um, you know, however you find podcasts, we're probably out. Obviously, a lot of your uh, episodes recently have had to focus on COVID for obvious reasons, like you said. Would you mind just maybe running through some of the topics and, and issues that you discussed as a team on these podcasts? Some of the COVID topics? Yes. Um, actually, our latest one is with Jeremy Warner, who's at my institution, putting together this Triple C 19 um, consortium that was just published in Lancet uh, two days ago. Um, so that's been um, uh, that was a podcast just looking at that big data set, which is the largest data set to come out so far. It's had a lot of media coverage. Prior to that, we looked at, um, we, had in, we had one with a cardiologist looking at cardiac effects. We had one, probably our most popular one was with Chuck Drake and Doug Johnson looking at immunotherapy and its effect on COVID, which is largely an unknown, but seems to have garnered a lot of interest. Um, we did some where we just talked about how COVID was affecting each institution in each country and how are we dealing with GU cancers and you know, elective surgeries and chemotherapy and delays and which patient populations, you've seen a lot of that from different institutions. So looking at that perspective, um, Chris, I don't know if you remember other ones, but kind of, it's kind of soup to nuts, you know, everything that we thought was important and experts that we could find who were willing to come on. Uh, yeah, I would say the other thing is trying to be topical. So each iteration after GUASCO, after PASCO obviously, um, with the COVID pandemic, hopefully we never have to do that again. Um, but it's just trying to be instructive for the general physician and distilling it down, be, um, be it urologist, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, there's a med on flavor. And also just at times yeah. recognizing that um, we're all in this together and it's not, it doesn't have to be a stiff conversation. And sometimes we make errors. I just realized I made an error in this conversation. And I thought about <laughs> six years and I actually meant 60 months, which is five years in these with regards to the Spartan, Aramis, and uh, Prosper studies. So not six years, five years versus uh, <laughs> six years, is what I meant. We will take requests too. We will take podcast requests if, if you want. Can, people can direct message me on Twitter. We'll, we'll, we'll consider podcast requests. How's that? <laughs> and absolutely, let's be very clear. There will be no karaoke requests. Take <laughs> No karaoke right. Noted. No karaoke requests. <laughs> Thank you both so much. It was really great being able to sit down with you virtually, Dr. Rini and Dr. Suni. Thank you for okay. taking time out of the ASCO weekend to talk with Ankh Live, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the ASCO virtual meeting. Thanks, Jen. Thanks to you and Ankh Live for helping spread the good word. It's great stuff. Of course. Thank you. We are here with Dr. Roy Herbst, who is the Enzyme Professor of Medicine and Professor of Pharmacology and the Chief of Medical Oncology at Yale Cancer Center and Smello Cancer Hospital, as well as the Associate Cancer Director of Translational Research at Yale Cancer Center. Dr. Herbst, thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, pleasure to be here, virtually at, at least. Yes, absolutely. So the OSCO 2020 meeting 
Do you have any thoughts on the new format and the approach that ASCO has taken? Well, I think it's been done so well and, and, uh, and meeting with people, especially this year where I gave a plenary talk. It's, it's nice that the data are getting out and they'll be available to physicians and, and, and patients and, and everyone that needs it to, to further the field. So uh, things are moving forward despite you know, the challenges that we're all dealing with. And on some of the lung so could you please tell us about this trial and why the final being phenomenal and basically this reminds me of ASCO you're, you're too young to remember 2005 and then there was a drug Herceptin to earlier disease uh, what we see is that if you have biology and you use a targeted agent and you take it from Uh, to 3A disease, um, patients can get uh, adjuvant chemotherapy if appropriate and uh, if the, the patient and physician feel that the, the person should get it, to then randomize one-to-one -to, -one to asimertinib, 80 milligrams a day, or to a placebo. And the endpoint is disease-free survival. Um, and, um, and as I said, we expected a few more years before we would see a result. We had targeted this trial for a hazard ratio of 0 0.7. And um, sure enough, what I presented here at ASCO was a hazard ratio of 0 0.17. So, um, you know, that, that, it, that it spreads, you know, you know, quickly. You know, even with surgery, you know, many patients will recur. You know, at, at stage three disease, you know, more than three quarters have recurred. At, 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 at five years. So now in patients that have the EGFR mutation, and it's about 10 to 15 percent in the United States, this was a have metastases to the brain, the liver, the bone, uh, truly could be exciting. So th these are people in there and with, you know, hearing the crowd. Uh, but as long as the data are getting out there, I think it's just phenomenal. And then, you know, we'll be following up on these for uh, year, years to come. And importantly, hopefully, we'll get to patients uh, as quickly as possible. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Congratu congratulations on this research. It really is some really phenomenal data. I think so I, we'll have to extrapolate because no one trial contains all the, all the, all the arms for control. But I have to think that there's something there that there, if we could figure out who those patients are with metastatic lung cancer, percent alive at three years, amazing news. So 30% of patients at, 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 you know, at three years. So further biomarker work needs to be done. Actually, Scott Gettinger, my colleague at Yale, who discussed the, the results at ASCO here, um, uh, is running a trial known as BMS-592, which actually is ipilimumab, nivolumab in the frontline setting. It's oh. all, all comers. So again, it needs a little bit of sorting out. But um, one's going to have to say, is this any better than that, um, given that there are increased toxicity by, by adding in the ipilimumab? But, um, but, you know, it's, it's something that can be, be looked at. And again, it's who gets what. Um, as a clinician, you know, who has patients in the clinic, I saw patients up in, in North Haven, actually. We actually moved our, some of our clinics to North Haven during this COVID epidemic. I saw patients on Tuesday. And when you have a frontline patient, we have all these options. 
And we still need a little bit more science here, Gina, to figure out, you know, what are the markers? You know, who should get uh, non-chemo uh, combos? Who should get chemo combo? But I think patients, you know, the ipilimumab and nivolumab at least, I think a non-chemo combo is what people uh, are looking for. And intuitively it makes sense. If you can avoid chemo, uh, let's do that. But it's, we're still a long ways from figuring out who should get what. But it's nice to have these things in the, in the chest of, 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 of armamentarium to offer to people. Those are some excellent points. Thank you so much. Now, I also want to talk about the Cityscape trial. That's been getting a lot of buzz as well from this year's meeting, looking at the uh, anti-TIGID antibody, tirogolumab, um, in combination with atezolizumab in frontline therapy for pd one positive non-small cell lung cancer. So what about this agent that's been really exciting so far and the intriguing data with it? Yeah, I, I saw it, and uh, you know, you know, uh, this is a nice, you know, you know, it's nice to see a new agent, something novel, um, and uh, there certainly are activity, um, at least in a phase two trial, both in terms of response rate and progression-free survival, of adding TIGIT, another checkpoint, uh, you know, uh, uh, involved in, in immune regulation. So here's an antibody against TIGIT, and adding that in combination with atezolizumide, a PDL1 antibody, and I believe the response rate was was double. And the hazard ratio uh, was in, point, in the 0.5 to 0.6 range, meaning that there was an improvement across all comers. The benefits seen most uh, significantly in those patients who are PDL1 high. There, I think the hazard ratio was in the 0.3 range, um, with a 50% response rate for the combo. There wasn't much benefit seen in, in a small trial in the PDL1 1 to 49%. I think this is early. This is a small trial. A couple of responders either way can shift it, but I think this is a signal. So from Cityscape, I, I see they're building skyscrapers. So they're going to be these new, and you know, I passed New York uh, the other day, uh, plenty of skyscrapers. New, now we need phase three trials, bigger phase two trials. Um, I would also, as I said earlier, we need more science. You know, are these patients who are TIGIT high or low? You know, if you look at the literature, it's hard to know exactly what the rate of TIGIT positivity is. Uh, you can find reports from 20% to 40 to 80 or 90%, which means no one really knows yet. But, you know, is there a biomarker that could help this? But it is very exciting to see new things coming to clinic with early signs of activity. These drugs will probably be used up front for primary uh, resistance. It always strikes me that, you know, in Keynote 24, uh, pembrolizumab has a 40, 50% response rate. In people who are pd one high, why don't all patients respond? So maybe there are other checkmates that are in checkpoints that are involved, and this could be one of them. Um, but again, you know, all, all positive and, and a step forward. Well, wonderful insight. Thank you so much. Now, I do want to focus a little bit on small cell lung cancer. Obviously, we're seeing some data with Dravalimab and also um, Pembrolizumab plus Atoposide and Platinum Therapy in frontline uh, small cell lung cancer with extensive stage disease in the Keynote 604 study. So would you be able to shed light on these immunotherapy uh, data in small cell lung cancer? Right. Well, we have three uh, now. There's, of course, the Empower study with the Tezolizumide, which was the first. We saw that at the World Conference of Lung Cancer, the ISLAC meeting, that I guess was in Toronto uh, uh, almost two years ago. Um, uh, uh, and, and that trial, of course, led to the approvement, approval of atezolizumab. Caspian looks almost similar uh, with uh, dervalimab. And my sense is in small cell, when you use a, a, check, uh, a, a, a checkpoint inhibitor in combination with chemotherapy, there's, there's benefit, clearly. Hazard ratios, though, are modest, you know, you know the 0.8 range uh, or, or so. Um, and, you know, a lot of patients progress. If you look at the progression curve, you know, it goes down very quickly. Uh, Charlie Rudin's data with uh, pembrolizumab, the PFS curves look almost identical to the others. The survival curve, frankly, doesn't look much different, except it just missed uh, hitting overall survival significantly. My sense is that all of these drugs, uh, is this, you know, certainly only two of them met their statistical endpoint, but uh, it's a step forward in small cell, but it's a baby step. I think the fact that you see some trials positive, some negative, magnitude of benefit just so-so, tells me that we need, we need something more. You know, uh, clearly there's something there, but we, we're going to need other agents in small cell. We're going to need other combinations of immune therapy. But, it, but, it, but again, it is progress. Immunotherapy works almost everywhere, just at different extents. But it's very hard to measure pd one by the way, in small cell. You know, getting a biopsy, there's a lot of crush artifact. Um, you, know, you know, very hard to be quantitative about it. So I think that it was good to see the results from the... Uh, the, the, the keynote trial was a rare exception of where one of the pembrolizumab trials doesn't always have a higher magnitude benefit than the others, uh, but clearly a safe you know, combination. And there's activity there, just, just missing a bar.
Very, very good points. Thank you so much. And then finally, are there is there any other lung cancer research that's being presented at ASCO this year that you're really interested or other abstracts that you're authored on that you'd like to highlight? A absolutely. So um, Mary Redman, you know, a brilliant statistician from um, Fred Hutchinson, uh, who leads our SWAG uh, Lung Committee Statistical Group, is presenting the results of LungMap, the LungMaster protocol. And um, you know, this is a trial that we've now been, been running for about six years. Um, and this is the first uh, iteration of lung map where basically uh, we took patients uh, with squamous cell lung cancer and they were all profiled using foundation medicine profiling and then they were sorted to different sub-studies based on the biomarker. So you can find patients, you know, with PI3 kinase abnormalities or with CDK4-6 abnormalities or uh, abnormalities in an FGF receptor. And then of course we had non-matched arms where we, where we looked at uh, immunotherapy and immunotherapy combinations. So Mary is presenting that as a poster, virtual poster. Uh, be interested to see how she does that. Maybe a hologram or something like that. But um, these are exciting uh, things because it sh speaks to the personaliz personalization of therapy. And then equally important is the new uh, iteration of lung map, where now we include both squamous and non-squamous lung cancer, all refractory disease, but um, most of the patients will have received immunotherapy. And uh, we have a whole bunch of new targets that we're studying, including, uh, you know, uh, KRAS and, and, and RET. Uh, so these are going to be ways to not only find patients, but also get drugs to patients throughout the United States, which is a very important uh, thing, to get testing and drugs to people. And then we're testing new immunotherapy combinations like ramacirumab, pembrolizumab. And actually, I'm presenting a poster on that at, uh, at ASCO as well. Um, uh, it's probably up as we speak, and, and, and that, that's important because that, um, that combination appears to have some activity and we have some um, uh, immune signatures that seem to tell us who, who benefits more. So science, uh, I think we're seeing, you know, on both sides of the spectrum, big phase three pro you know, cha practice changing studies and early studies where we're getting signals that will then lead to the phase threes in the future. Dr. Herbst, this was really, really fantastic insight. Thank you so much for being on with us today and stay safe. Um, you too, and thank you very much. Thank you. That's all for today. Stay tuned for tomorrow's Enclave News Network on location at the 2020 ASCO Virtual Scientific Program. We'll be serious on takeaways from this year's meeting. Thank you for watching Enclave News Network. I'm Gina Columbus.